Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're uh, enjoying a, a, a nice, uh, technically spring day. It is, it is, it is uh, cool in Toronto. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us today um, for the IAI's uh, webinar on avoidance actions and enforcement of foreign insolvency judgment in NAFTA countries. Uh, my name is Catherine Esau. I'm a partner with Osler's Restructuring Group in Toronto, Canada, and I'm very pleased to be moderating the panel today. With me, we've got Evan Hollander. He is a partner in the restructuring group at Oric in New York. We've got Dario Oscos Abogado, who is a restructuring partner uh, in Mexico City and at, at Oscos Abogado. And we have Jane Dietrich, who is a restructuring partner at Castles, Brock and Blackwell at, uh, in Toronto as well. Thank you for being here today, everybody. Just to kick it off generally, so avoidant actions are a common tenet of insolvency law across jurisdictions and generally provide a mechanism for transactions that benefit the debtor and one creditor, such as fraudulent conveyances and preferences, to the detriment of others to be unwound or voided at the direction of the governing insolvency court. There are, of course, uh, variations in what constitutes an avoidance action. And we have assembled this panel to representing the United States, Mexico, and Canada to talk about the ins and outs of avoidance actions in their respective countries. And we're looking forward to an interactive panel. Please feel free to use the Q&A bar or enter a question in the chat if you have any questions and I will do my best to monitor those. So as a, as a first general introduction of the, uh, general introduction of the topic, who generally benefits from the recovery of avoidable transfer under your insolvency regime? And Evan, I'm hoping you can lead us off on this question. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, good afternoon from New York to everyone participating. Um, before I get into who, who benefits, um, maybe a little overview of the type of, of actions. Broadly speaking, there are two basic types of voidable transactions across uh, Canada, the US and Mexico. Uh, in the US, we refer to them as preferences and fraudulent conveyances. Uh, a preference is a payment in respect of a valid obligation of the debtor, which is made within 90 days prior to a bankruptcy or one year in the case of an insider of the debtor that enables a creditor to recover more than the creditor would have recovered if the payment had not been made and the creditor had received distribution on such claim in a liquidation of the debtor. Uh, with respect to fraudulent transfers or fraudulent conveyances, there are, there are two basic types. Actual fraudulent conveyance uh, is and constructively fraudulent conveyances. Uh, an actual fraudulent conveyance is a transfer that is made with actual intent to hinder, delay, or defraud creditors. Uh, of course, uh, actual intent is very difficult to establish. So when uh, determining intent, intent uh, courts will look back to a 16th century uh, English statute, uh, statute 13 of Elizabeth, that identify, identified certain behaviors uh, that will evidence intent, uh, such as the debtor concealing the transfer, the debtor uh, transferring the assets to a close relative, the debtor retaining use of the asset after the purported transfer and similar actions uh, similar, similar to that. Um, constructive fraudulent conveyances or transfers made or obligations incurred in, in, in exchange for less than reasonably equivalent value uh, prior to a bankruptcy filing while the debtor is insolvent. Uh, in, the in the US, there are avoidance action provisions in the federal bankruptcy code that are applicable to all 50 states, as well as separate provisions under the laws of each of the 50 states. Uh, outside of a bankruptcy case, uh, a fraudulent, tra fraudulent transfer action may be brought by an individual creditor uh, for the benefit, uh, the exclusive benefit of that individual creditor. In a bankruptcy case, avoidance actions are generally brought by the estate fiduciaries uh, who may utilize either the bankruptcy code avoidance provisions or the applicable state law avoidance provisions I just referenced, but in either case in a bankruptcy proceeding, all recoveries of such actions will ordinarily be for the benefit of the general unsecured creditors uh, as a class. 
Thanks, Evan. And Dario, how does that kind of contrast with um, with uh, voidable transfers in, in your jurisdiction in Mexico? Well, in Mexico, uh, I should first indicate that the governing law of the insolvency, commercial insolvency is a federal law, Ley de Concursos Mercantiles. This law provides, of course, for the set aside actions of those uh, fraudulent transfers and preferences that have been executed as of the date of the retroactive period, that is the suspicious period within which all uh, transactions that fall in this suspicious periods may be set aside in case they defraud and damage the bankruptcy state. The, oh, there are some transactions qualified by needing the element of intent, and there are others that do not need that element of intent. For instance, a gifting transaction where the debtor does not receive a consideration is fraudulent by virtue of law without need to prove any intent. While there are other um, transactions such as the creation of incre or increase of warranties where there is a need to prove bona fide by the counterparty. Here, the, in the, the element of intent is a presumption of the law. So in general, the, the Mexican provisions provide for this void and section within the suspicious period. Thanks, that's, that's, that's uh, very interesting. And, and Jane, in Canada, how do you find that that uh, contrasts from what Evan and Dorio have been saying? So uh, I think one of the interesting things that, that Evan mentioned was who is actually benefiting from them and who can actually bring them. Um, and I just want to contrast a bit with Canada. Um, we have preferences and we call them transfers under value rather than fraudulent conveyances now. And really I'm gonna talk about when there's an insolvency proceeding. Like Evan, we have um, provincial law based on the statute of Elizabeth from the 1300s that people can take individual actions, but let's just kind of ignore it because it's very difficult. Um, but in Canada, I think one of the big differences is a secured creditor, if their security agreement is worded appropriately, gets the benefit of the avoidance actions. And so to the extent that there's money to claw back, it's not necessarily going to the unsecured creditors. And so you need to take that into consideration and in whether or not you want to claw things back or who you're clawing things back from. Obviously, if there's no secure creditor or if the security agreement doesn't capture all of the assets, including the proceeds of any of these types of actions, then the trustee of bankruptcy, a monitor, or based on some recent case law, the company in a debtor in possession, finance, like a debtor in possession, see civil aid proceeding, can bring the actions. And then the proceeds would either go to the company if it's still a debtor in possession or their unsecured creditors, but it would just fall to where you sit in the estate. Um, but I think it's much more common that there is a secure creditor who has security over everything including the proceeds of these actions. And perhaps for that reason, we see them a, a bit pursued less often in Canada than we would south of the border. That, that, sounds, that sounds right, yeah. And is there, is there an element of intent that is assumed when you're looking at uh, avoidance actions, which either needs to be rebutted or needs to be established at, at first instance in, in each of these jurisdictions? Maybe Jane, you can kind of lead, lead us off on that one. Sure, so I think like Dario mentioned, some have intent and some don't. Um, and there's a little bit of a breakdown between whether or not the party's related to you or not related. So if they're arm's length or not at arm's length. In a transfer at undervalue, and that is where it's similar to the fraudulent conveyance. So you've transferred property away and you haven't received proper consideration or you've received conspicuously less than fair market consideration back. Um, in the year before, the initial bankruptcy event, um, if it's an arm's length, so non-related parties, then you do need to show, among other things, that there was an intent of the debtor to defraud, defeat, or hinder a creditor. However, if there are related parties or non-arm's length parties, there is no intent in the first year. And you don't even have to show that someone was insolvent in the first year. 
um, prior to the initial bankruptcy event. But if you want to look farther back, and so between four, one to five years, um, then you need to also prove the added intent that there was an intent to defeat defraud, defeat, or delay a creditor. On the preference side, it's similar. So if, if you have um, non-arm's length parties, so related parties, you can go back a year. So it's a longer look back. Um, and all you have to show is the effect. So the effect of the payment, did it in fact prefer one creditor over another? And there's no question about intent at all. To contrast that, if you switch to arm's length or non-related parties, the look back period is shorter. It's only three months as opposed to 12. And you do have to prove intent, but it's a rebuttable presumption. So the if the effect of the transfer was to prefer one creditor over another, then it is assumed that that's the intent unless you can show other evidence that there was an, a different intent to the transaction to stay in business, um, whatever it may be. But what you can't do in rebutting that presumption is lead evidence of pressure. So that doesn't, so you can't say that they coerced me into it. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but it's definitely um, when you're thinking about related parties, odds are you don't have to prove intent and non, non arm's length part or arm's length parties, non-related parties, then you do. <laughs> And, and Evan, I know you kind of talked a little bit about it uh, in your in your intro, but how do, how does kind of the U.S. system layer into or differ from the Canadian system? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Catherine. So, um, just touching on um, with respect to actual fraud, which which I mentioned earlier, uh, obviously there uh, you have to show an intent to hinder, delay, or defraud creditors, but since actual intent is very difficult to uh, establish. We have certain indicia or badges of fraud uh, that will stand in uh, and, and if found in sufficient uh, number, uh, a court will find that there's actual fraud. But with respect to preferences and uh, um, uh, constructive fraudulent transfers, there's absolutely no uh, intent uh, whatsoever, regardless of whether it's an insider uh, or an arm's length uh, creditor. Um, so unlike other jurisdictions, uh, Canada, I know that's the same in, in England as well. Uh, there's no intent uh, element in uh, bankruptcy code preference action. Uh, the paramount goal uh, of a preference action is the equitable distribution of estate assets uh, and is intended to dissuade uh, creditors from pushing the company into a bankruptcy proceeding at the first sign of distress by distress by uh, putting uh, uh, pressure on the debtor to pay to pay debts or rush racing to the courthouse to carve up the debtor. Um, whether that actually works uh, in 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 the real world uh, is uh, another story. Um, people tend to to not worry about uh, taking act taking a, a a distribution on the eve of bankruptcy. It's always better to have the money and and negotiate for giving it back as a preference. To not have it at all. Most of these actions are are settled uh, and not litigated. And um, I think most counsel would 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 when asked would say, you know, take take the money, and we'll worry about later whether whether it needs to be disgorged. Um, in the case of constructive fraudulent transfers, um, there is also no element of um, intent in order to establish a intent on, on the part of the transferor, the debtor, to establish a constructive fraudulent transfer. All you need show is the debtor was insolvent um, and transfer the asset for less than reasonably equivalent value. So you don't have to show market value, but reasonably equivalent value. Um, and uh, generally under the bankruptcy code, there's a look back period of two years um, that uh, the, the court can go uh, rec uh, recover uh, transfers made uh, within two years of the filing. Uh, there's no presumption of insolvency, however. So uh, if a court is seeking to recover a transfer two years before a bankruptcy filing, the, if a debtor is seeking to, to recover a transfer within two years of a bankruptcy filing, they would need to establish that the debtor was insolvent at the time of the transfer. 
Um, under state law, which is also uh, available to uh, a debtor in bankruptcy or a debtor in possession or a trustee, uh, the look back period is, is, is often longer, three, four, and even six years. Um, so uh, sometimes when you're outside of the bankruptcy code uh, recovery provision, uh, courts, uh, debtors will, will choose to use the state law uh, avoidance actions. Um, while there's no um, uh, requirement of intent to establish intent on behalf of uh, on behalf of the transferor, I think it's worth mentioning that as for the transferee, whether the transferees have knowledge of the uh, avoidable transfer, they, they have uh, different results. So um, someone who uh, acquires uh, an asset from a debtor for less than reasonably equivalent value on the eve of the bankruptcy, who really didn't know anything about the transfer or the, or the, or the debtor's situation, um, will be liable strictly for the return of that asset. But if they were, you know, acted in good faith without knowledge of the debtor's insolvency, they'll at least get a credit or a secured claim for the amount actually paid. Um, with respect to subsequent transferees, because courts can go after not only an initial transferee of a fraudulent transfer, but also parties who that initial transferee then transfers the property onto, um, the, um, the subsequent transferee it takes for good faith and provides any value whatsoever is a complete defense to avoidance of the transfer but if they did know about the underlying um, uh, voidability of the initial transfer, they get no defense and, and have to return the, uh, the full amount of the assets. The, the assets are their value. So Dario, is uh, Mexico closer to Canada, closer to the US or a different beast entirely? Well, I think that in essence, we have very similar uh, provisions. First of all, I will say that regarding bankruptcy for commercial debtors, is a federal law and applies only the federal law. So here we have uh, the retroactive period, as I mentioned, that it is of 270 calendar days that could be doubled in case of related uh, persons involved in the transactions or insiders, subordinated creditors, or even commonality of officers, directors, or members of the board of directors. This period of time, the retroactive period, may be extended up to two years. But I would say that in Mexico, the general rule is that transaction is regarded as fraudulent against the state when the debtor performs the wrongdoing, knowing about it, and the counterparty is aware of the wrongdoing, but that's the general rule. And we have two sets of uh, cases provided for under the law that assume that the, uh, fraud, the fraudulent transaction is as such by virtue of law. And these are, these do not need to have the intent to be proven, proven or established. These are the following gifting transactions where there is no consideration towards debtor, overvalue or undervalue transactions against the state, transactions against regular prevailing marking practices, terms and conditions, write-off or debt remissions, payment of obligations not due, discount of debtor's own notes by debtor, which is considered prepayment. There are another rules that provide that the transaction that falls within the suspicious period is presumed to be a fraudulent transaction or less debt or an interested party otherwise prove, prove that they acted on their good faith. So the burden to prove is of the beneficiary of the transaction. Of course, that any recovering collector from a set aside actions goes to the bankruptcy state. Which are these specific transactions? Well, creation of warranties or the increase of any existing warranties, it is presumed to be fraudulent unless counterparty proves that it, is, it acted in good faith. Payments of this made in kind when the original 
obligation was otherwise or was payable in cash or vice versa. Acts performed by the debtor with related individuals or related legal entities or among community of directors, officers, members of the board of directors or controlling shareholders. Then, then let me tell you that there is, in addition to the set aside action or close back actions, a action of against directors liability while debtor in insolvency and they cause or incur in wrongdoing and cause damages to the estate. This uh, action may be enforced directly by the debtor, by uh, some other qualified people having legal standing to enforce, which is the same debtor, one fifth of the allowed creditors, allowed creditor representing 20% of the debt, 25% of shareholders or interventor receivership. Now, here the, the issue is that any recovery for, from this a liability action goes to the bankruptcy state. So I, I guess, you know, it's it's interesting too to bring it into more the of the international sphere and just just looking at our time, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna skip right to the last question. But um Dario, maybe or Dario, could you maybe just start us off for for a minute about the methods that are available to enforce a foreign insolvency proceeding or order in your jurisdiction? Yes, thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, there are two ways to enforce uh, insolvency. Uh, judgment. One is uh, under the Mexican Title 12, which incorporates modern law on cross-border insolvency uh, that provides for the uh, recognition of foreign bankruptcy proceedings as main proceeding or no main proceeding. But Mexican law provides some qualifications. First is that um, reciprocity, reciprocity is mandatory. Second, if debtor has an establishment in Mexico, a full concurso mercantil has to be open and prosecuted up to the end. If there is no establishment of debtor, the uh, proceeding is a summary proceeding, very fast proceeding for the recognition. And it provides for all the relief that may be granted upon the filing of the recognition petition or upon the um, <clears throat> recognition uh, of the foreign proceeding. But what happens the question is about insolvency proceedings. I mean, uh, about insolvency judgments. Well, if unrelated or to a bankruptcy proceeding, we may follow to Title 12, or otherwise we will need to follow the general regime for the recognition of general judgments on civil and commercial matters. And Evan, is that similar to the way it works in the U.S.? Oh, sorry, Evan, you're on mute. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we've adopted the model law, and it uh, it is Chapter 15 of the Bankruptcy Code. Um, and in order to uh, gain recognition of a foreign proceeding in the U.S., there's no reciprocity requirement. Um, some folks, when the, before the uh, Chapter 15 was adopted, were worried about uh, recognition of proceedings in other countries that perhaps didn't uh, have a rule of law and things like that. There's no uh, issue of comedy uh, before opening a proceeding. But um, when you really look at the model law and, the, and, and Chapter 15, the mere recognition doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. It's uh, additional assistance in the case, and that's when a court would apply and look at things like uh, issues of, of comedy and fairness in the, in the other jurisdiction. Um, with respect to enforcement of insolvency, foreign insolvency proceedings, uh, you can do that in a chapter 15. Um, uh, and I think it's kind of a recommended way to do that. At the end of the bankruptcy case, um, a foreign bankruptcy case, you come back in the, um, in the chapter 15 and seek an enforcement order. Uh, giving effect to the foreign uh, proceeding in the U.S. and giving a permanent injunction against any creditors uh, 
uh, for example, bringing, bringing claims under documents uh, that have been uh, modified. Um, you don't need uh, the, the benefit of doing it under under Chapter 15 in a, a, in a bankruptcy code is you have an, an order that's now effective throughout all 50 states. Um, if a creditor seeks to violate uh, the order and bring a claim anywhere, you basically can just show up in court and, and wave around the Chapter 15 order and get the case dismissed. Um, Alternatively, if you haven't filed a Chapter 15, you could just proceed under general principles of comedy to enforce that uh, restructuring. Uh, and again, the difficulty there is you end up perhaps playing a little bit of whack-a-mole because you, some creditor brings an action in one uh, jurisdiction and you persuade the court to grant comedy and, and dismiss the case. And then another creditor could bring an action in a second or third or fourth jurisdiction. So it can be done both ways, but there are efficiencies with doing it under Chapter 15. I'm hearing a lot of common themes that I feel like Jane might pick up when she uh, explains the Canadian structure. Sure. So like um, like the U.S. and frankly, like Mexico, we have the model law, modified version of the model law in our insolvency statutes. And so if you're doing a full proceeding recognition, that's really where you need to go. There's no requirement for reciprocity under that. However, if, if you get to the question of a foreign judgment, if you do have a judgment for the payment of money, you can move under principles of comedy and common law to get that independently recognized. And there's no requirement that you have the full insolvency proceeding recognized. So specifically, if you would have a judgment, a, a transfer under value, a preference judgment, or some kind of fraudulent conveyance judgment, then as long as you actually have a final judgment, in, and it's against a person, so it's in personam, for a sum of money and it was issued by a court that has jurisdiction to issue the judgment. And really that gets down to, is there a real and substantial connection between that court and the issue and the actual matter at issue? Then the Canadian court through principles of comedy typically will recognize and enforce that judgment. And when I say Canadian court, I obviously mean specific provinces, right? So you need to go to each individual province. Um, but if there is, uh, a desire to have just a, a, a judgment enforced rather than a full proceeding that can definitely happen through a much more streamlined process. Thanks, Jane. Uh, we had one question. Um, I thought it was a good one and I, I think we've got a minute for it. So, um, and I think this might've been in respect of something Dorio said, um, uh, but we've been asked to confirm the status of a third party who may have purchased a asset transferred at undervalue in good faith. Um, just really briefly, if, if anybody wants to touch on that for a minute or so, that would be great. Jane, you want to start off? Sure, or? sure. I'll, I'll start off quickly. Um, yep. In Canada, if you have a true third party, a purchaser for value in good faith, then you're not going to be able to recover that property from them. And then quickly in the U.S., if it's an initial transferee, you would be able to recover the property. It's strict, uh, strict liability. We call it constructive fraudulent transfer rather than transaction under value. Uh, but if you're acting in good faith, you at least get a credit for the amount uh, you actually paid. If you're a subsequent transferee, someone who takes from the initial transferee and you pay anything and you acted in good faith, you, you get to keep the, uh, the, the asset. Dario, how about you? Uh, it will be about the same that in the United States. The transferee, if acted in good faith and proven the good faith, the transaction will be not set aside. But if there is a subsequent transferee, uh, that, trans that transfer will be legal valid and binding upon the parties. However, the transfer or the one incurring in the, world do in the, in the wrongdoing may be liable to pay damages to the bankruptcy state. So that's important to see if you go the way to uh, set aside the transaction or to uh, get the indemnity for a, the wrongdoing goes to the bankruptcy state. Well, guys, thank you so much. I know from our from our prepara preparatory discussion and from today, I've learned a lot about avoidance actions uh, in Canada, embarrassingly, but also in the U.S. and Mexico as well. So, thank you so much for your time. Um, I know this was uh, this was very valuable for me and hopefully our attendees as well. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You.
Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.